we're very happy to have uh, uh, Toby Moskowitz presenting uh, his paper trading costs and um, Pete Kyle as his discussant. So the format is as usual, 40 minutes for, um, for Toby's talk and 20 minutes for discussion. And the whole hour is as usual recorded. Um, feel free to uh, drop your questions in the chat box. And um, after that, everyone is welcome to the informal chat. Um, and uh, with that, Toby, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for uh, joining. Um, just gonna share my screen here and uh, start the presentation. This is, uh, as, as, oops, as Pete knows, been working on, and he's been working on this a lot longer than I have, but I've, I've been working on this for a, a long time, uh, many years. Um, this is, uh, I'm gonna call this trading cost research. It's really, it was one paper that was has now been split into two, and there's I think probably multiple papers to work on here as well. Um, but it's um, it's ongoing work with um, two of my colleagues uh, at AQR Capital, Andrea Prezzini, who many of you know, and and Ronan Israel, um, who actually uh, created and ran the trading. Uh, algorithms at AQR for a long time. Um, and my association with AQR has um, basically prompted a lot of this research where we're using their actual trading costs to kind of look at, at, at T-cost models. And I think there's some interesting things um, to look at here, many of which we've only just scratched the surface. So let me jump right into it. Um, the research questions that um, we're interested in is how large are trading costs faced by a large arbitrageur or institution uh, using AQR as an example? Um, more importantly, I think, how are those costs achieved or what's behind them? Um, and then trying to understand, which I'm gonna focus on today, what the price impact function looks like and why. Um, and that's something that I don't think we understand that well in the literature and, and perhaps I'm wrong, um, but at least I, I didn't fully understand and I, I think we have something to say about that. Um, and then, you know, given that I'm gonna be using proprietary um, trading cost data from AQR, there's always the question as to how generalizable are these costs? Um, I probably won't get into too much of that today other than to say, I don't think the costs that I estimate are very different than what other people have estimated at other big firms. They're gonna look similar to a lot of Pete's work. Um, and so I think, I think these are fairly um, generic in, in that sense. And I'm gonna talk, and I also think the way they're generated is pretty generic as well. So I'll, I'll talk about that. There's obviously both academic and practitioner uh, questions here that we're gonna answer. From an academic perspective, I wanna understand how these costs compare to other costs that people use in the literature, understand why the, the you know, price impact function looks the way it does, from a practical perspective, just understanding this is helpful in terms of building better models, improving optimization, perhaps improving trading. Academics are somewhat interested in those questions as well, but, but maybe perhaps a bit less so. But I think there's interesting questions to answer for sure in all of this, and I'm not going to be able to answer. Um, I'll be lucky if I can answer any of them, but I certainly won't be able to answer any, uh, all of them. Give you a little background on the data. Um, we're gonna be looking at all long-term trades from AQR Capital. AQR is a hedge fund that runs a lot of um, market neutral and long only equity strategies. I'm only gonna be looking at equities. I am gonna be looking at them globally though. So the T costs I'm gonna estimate are not just for the US, but they're gonna be in 21 other uh, international or 20 other international markets. These are developed markets. Um, we actually have emerging trading cost data too. We trade in a lot of emerging markets. I'm not including any of that here today. Um, the data is going to end in 2016, just because this is how long I've been working on it. But we will, we are updating the data now through 2021. Uh, it's a fairly major undertaking. Um, just to, uh, a note here, these are longer term trades in the sense that you can think of these trades as being related to things like you know, value trading strategies or quality trading strategies. Maybe momentum is kind of the fastest trading strategy that we're looking at here. There's no, AQR does not do any high frequency trading. So we're not talking about intraday liquidity trades or sort of, you know, very short term trades. Um, we're just going to be looking at, the, at, the, at just the things that are associated with these kind of longer term signals. So you can think of that as roughly like monthly, quarterly rebalancing type strategies, some of them even annual rebalancing. Um, what I think is unique to the data we have, and this is, so there's a trade-off. The AQR data is very specific to AQR, obviously, and it's not what you would get from, say, um, Encerno or sort of large uh, brokerage houses. However, there's some nice features about having the data we have, which is um, I know what we actually traded, but I also know what we intended to trade. So one of the things that we can estimate here is 
Um, we can look at you know, the uh, expected trade size, but we can also look at the unexpected trade size of any position. So for instance, we might go to the market, and this is one of the variables that I think is going to be key to the analysis. We might look at, you know, say we're going to make a trade in Microsoft, and we think we're going to be half a percent of the daily volume. Well, our guess as to what our participation in that market will be is based off of some estimate of um, trading volume. But um, there's an unexpected component to that, which is when we actually go to trade, the volume may be a lot lower than we thought. And so we can look at those differences here, and I'm going to do that in a unique way to kind of plot out what the you know T cost function actually actually looks like when you're you know when you're looking at unexpected trades. I'll, I'll get into that in just a second. Okay, um, you know I think using this data is also interesting from the following perspective. I think um, what you get from from these trading cost data is um, you'd certainly get a very different picture of what real world transactions costs look like than if you're looking at say something like TAC data or trying to estimate price impact functions from you know trade and quote data, which is the average uh, trading cost. That doesn't look uh, a lot like the marginal trading cost facing an arbitrageur um, like 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 AQR. Okay. Also, I, I'll be uh, I'll get into this in a second, but the way well, let me just talk about how the, how the trades are executed, and then you'll get a sense of what I can estimate and what I cannot estimate. So, just some preliminaries here. I'm going to give you a quick example of what a live trade looks like in this database. Uh, and how we're going to measure trading costs. I'm then going to estimate a price impact function from that, and then I'm going to try to understand what that, why that price impact function looks the way it does. And I'm going to look at two pieces that are going to help me identify what that price impact function looks at. I'm going to try to take into account the endogeneity of trading, particularly trade size. So the idea that maybe we only trade a large order when we know the cost is going to be low, and maybe we only trade um, you know, quickly when we know the cost is going to be very low, I'm going to try to look at that and, and see if I can, um, you know, look at what the price impact function looks like trying to adjust for that endogeneity. I'm also going to be looking at, um, you know, permanent versus temporary market impact as well and have something to say about that. Um, and then I'll come back to future research efforts uh, a little bit later. So let me start with the preliminaries here. As I said, I've got every, every equity trade made by AQR um, from 1998 through 2016 in 21 developed markets. It's about 9,500 different stocks that are traded at about 1.7 trillion worth of trades. Um, I get the information on the orders, the execution prices, and the quantities. Um, and I can match that with you know, price return and volume data, of course. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, port, the, the trades that we're talking about here come from their kind of long-term models, things like value, quality, momentum. These are factors from the academic literature. No high frequency or price pressure or stat arb type trades are included here. Um, the way the trading process works is the model is run the night before, or the day before, uh, you generate a theoretical portfolio. Um, that theoretical portfolio then will suggest a number of trades that you wanna make the next day. And then you go to the market and you either make you make those trades depending on whether the opportunity cost of not trading exceeds the cost of actually trading, right? So we won't trade, you know, a position, for instance, if the opportunity cost of not trading is greater than the, the cost of trading, uh, but we will trade, um, you know, uh, uh, if, if the cost is low enough and the opportunity cost is high enough. So um, one of the things about the trades that are made here is uh, these trades will always get executed. It's just how quickly they get executed is the only thing that matters. So for instance, if I want to trade half a share of Microsoft, that trade will happen. It just may take a couple of days to happen uh, versus it might just take a couple of minutes. So 99.9% .9 of the desired trades do get completed in this database because these are long-term trades. It just might take some time for them to get traded. And that's going to be an important concept for thinking about what the trading cost looks like. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. Okay, the database contains orders, execution prices, quantities. Uh, we know if it's a buy or a sell, we know what the purpose of the buy or sell is. Was it buy for a long position, buying to cover, selling long or selling short? Um, turns out there's not huge differences, by the way, in trading costs, depending on what the nature of the trade is for those different reasons. Um, but importantly, the dollar size of trade is known uh, and mostly fixed. Like I said, we're going to be able to trade that. It just is a matter of whether we end up trading it over a few minutes a few or a few days. 
Um, but the percentage size of the trade is what's unknown. And that's going to be a function of whatever the trading volume is in markets, which we can't control. I'm going to try to exploit that today to get some identification for what the trading cost function looks like. Okay. So just to be clear here, the way that the AQR, the way that trades are executed at AQR is that the quantity of the trade is not really a choice variable. If we decide we're going to trade a million dollars worth of Microsoft, uh, we will execute that. But the duration or the patience of that trade is a choice variable. So what I'm going to be able to look at is price impact. That's a function of it's, you know, the, the quantity, the dollar quantity of trade is not really uh, um, a variable, but the time it takes to trade is. However, the fraction of the market that I'm trading is, a, is an unknown because I don't know what other people are trading. Okay. So I'm going to try to um, use that variation to, to, to understand um, what trading costs look like. Okay. Um, the way these things are traded, there's a um, there's a trade basket, which is a trade order set. Um, there's a parent order. So each trade basket is composed of a series of parent orders, which are orders in stocks, let's say 10,000 shares of IBM to cover. Um, there can be multiple parent orders per trade basket for a given stock, especially if the underlying position is changing. And the way the algorithm loosely works is that parent order is broken up into small child orders um, where the size of the orders are randomized, the timing of those orders are randomized. They're often distributed across multiple exchanges. Um, the idea here, of course, is you're trying to limit your footprint in the market so that people can't front run you. And that would you know, obviously impact your execution prices if high frequency traders are jumping in, in front of you, et cetera. So uh, I'm gonna aggregate all that up and call it a trade, but recognize that, that trade is divided up into a bunch of these tinier trades um, and executed at a, at a, in a sequence of trades, um, and I'm going to look at the entire price impact of that entire order. I think an, a numerical example is probably um, the best way, or a specific example is probably the best way to show this. The way these, these trades are executed is through uh, supplying a whole bunch of limit orders at various prices, where the idea, this is very passive trading, you're trying to uh, supply liquidity rather than demand it. Okay, so as an example here, this is a trade that was executed in Microsoft on May 8th, 2014 in a long only account. It's a trade for about 1.4% of Microsoft's um, volume using a one year rolling average of their daily trading volume. Okay, so it's a, an, an estimate of what, of what we were trying to trade in terms of the volume of Microsoft. This trade was executed over six minutes and three seconds. Um, and what you can see here is that we are submitting limit orders. Those are the red uh, squares there, um, you know, below the best bid offer, hoping that the price will jump down to hit that in the instant that we're trading. And we're constantly setting limit orders and canceling them um, to, um, to try to, um, you know, buy <clears throat> at as low a price as we can. Now, why do we cancel them? Well, you cancel them when if the price starts moving away from, from your limit order, you do want to execute this trade. So you may have to raise the price and set a new limit order as prices are moving uh, against you. Uh, and then what you're hoping is that you're just able to catch you know, that, that low bid when it, when it drops down. And you can see that the blue uh, diamonds here are the prices at which we ended up executing this particular trade, okay? Now the trade is, <clears throat> is the sum of all of these things. That's the parent trade, but you can see a lot of these you know, what we call children uh, trades, which are um, the, you know, the specific limit orders that we're doing to try to execute as low a price as possible. Okay. We're going to calculate trading costs using the shortfall and market impact method defined by parole, uh, which people typically use. Um, and again, shortfall is not going to be as, uh, we're going to be uh, defining market impact as obviously the quantity of, you know, the execution price minus the starting price uh, times the amount we were uh, trading. Probably best to see this in real time. <clears throat> this is what a trade would look like. Uh, the models run the night before. We get a, a set of trades that we want to execute uh, this day, okay, or this period of time. And um, you know, before the markets open, there's uh, some movement that that can happen. Sort of the pre-execution that ought to be random. If it's not random, in other words, if the, the expected value of the price uh, changes is anything different from zero, then we have the wrong model. We should take that into account and and adjust our model. Uh, and then what happens is we start to execute our trades. 
okay? And this is just an example of, let's say we're buying a particular stock. It's broken up into about, um, you know, 10 different orders here, 10 children orders here. Those are the prices that we end up executing at. And the portfolio, you know, our position is completed at some point during the day. So there's your execution period. And what we're going to call price impact is essentially the integral underneath um, that uh, entire curve. So it's the price we executed at versus the price we starting at started at times the number of shares we executed at at each of these uh, positions. Okay, and we could define a little bit later how much of that price impact reverses let's say over the next day and call that temporary versus how much is permanent. And I'll be more formal about this in just a second, how we're gonna calculate this. It turns out that just looking at the, you know, 24 hours later is probably not good enough. You probably wanna take into account whether you've traded the same stock over the last couple of weeks as well. And so we'll, we'll do that uh, in addition. Okay, all right. So uh, let's talk about estimating a trading cost function from these live trades. That's what a trade is. That's what I'm gonna call um, the cost of trading, the, the price impact. Um, and now let's kind of see what that looks like when we actually um, try to characterize this function. So for every trade, um, the you know millions of trades that AQR has made, um, um, and we calculate the, the price impact of those trades, um, we're going to um, just regress those price impact measures on a bunch of variables that people suggested is related to trading costs. And this, by the way, is not too different from the actual model that AQR uses. It's got a few more bells and whistles, but the nuts and bolts of it are all right here. So these are pooled regressions. The left-hand side is the market impact in basis points per dollar traded, okay? And oh, I should mention, we're scaling the market impact on a daily level per daily volume. So that we're putting everything on, on the same scale. I'll get to timing in, in, in just a second, the duration of the trade. And the explanatory variables um, are going to be, you can think of them as, as three groups. There's variables that are just general conditions of the market, like the VIX, um, as, as one example. There are characteristics that are specific to the stock we're trading. What's the size of the firm? Uh, what's its idiosyncratic volatility? And then there's characteristics as to the trade itself, which is how much are we trading relative to how much is being traded in the market at that time. So as you can see here, we're running a regression of market impact on the left-hand side. On We need to let the regression know whether it's a buy or a sell. And we also want to know whether the market is you know, going up or down. That's going to obviously affect what we calculate as a market impact, but we want to strip that out. We put in a time trend, the market cap, log market cap of the stock, the fraction of daily volume we're trading, and the square root of the fraction of daily volume that we're trading. And these are our participation rates. This is the size of the trade. And uh, we put in a square root function here because from a lot of Pete's work and other people's work, this is typically what people find in the data. And you can see it right here that market impact costs seem to follow a square root function, okay? uh, concave function, where um, you know, uh, costs increase with the trade size, but at a decreasing rate. All right. And some of the other variables show up like you, you, know, you would expect, idiosyncratic volatility, small cap stocks uh, generally have larger trading costs. When the market's more volatile, you pay more mar market impact. And then we also have a control here. This is, the, this is a, um, the return on a matched set of stocks that have the same value, momentum, and size characteristics times whether we're you know, buying or selling in the same, dire in the same direction. And you know uh, that's really just controlling for what's going on in the market. You could have just used beta times the market here as another way to control for what's going on in the market. This is just a little more precise given the characteristics that we're trading. Now, one thing I'll, I'll have you notice here is you know the R squareds here are pretty large, right? This is a um, you're talking about explaining market impact costs. This is like daily returns. You can get a 15% R squared. Most of it's coming from the contemporaneous movement in the market but you're still getting a fair bit of explanatory power from these other uh, variables as well. And also notice this square root function, this is the full, this is the US, this is uh, international. Um, so in the other 20 countries, the, the coefficients and the square root function uh, seem to be a good characterization of how, uh, what trading costs look like um, everywhere, not, not just in the United States. Okay. So if I were to plot this out, this is what you get. Um, and this is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's concave, 
um, you know, we often have models that 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 suggest that it, it ought to be linear. But at least when you look at the data, it looks like this. It looks like a square root function. And you can actually do like a log log plot to see, you know, is a square root function a reasonable approximation of the data? Yeah, it's pretty good. It's not it's not bad, right? But it, it's certainly some concave function, uh, nonlinear function um, between trade size and um, and market impact. Now, by the way, why, why is that? Coming back to this for a second, the um, you know the the reason this variable is pretty interesting, the uh, the trade size is this is the one variable that you can control, right? You can sort of control which stocks you trade. You can't control what's going on in markets generally, um, but trade size is something you have a lot of control over. Um, and so that's 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 the one that we we typically focus on. Um, before I get, so I want to I want to focus on this participation rate because I'm going to try to use that to 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 try to understand what the trade T cost function looks like. Here's a distribution of trade size and duration of trade. Remember, I said that the trade size itself, the dollar trade size, is not really a choice variable in the way we trade, but the duration, how long it takes to trade, is. Um, so you can see here, this is a distribution of the participation rate. Most of the trades we make are less than half a percent of the daily volume of, of a stock, but there is a large right tail. Sometimes we end up, you know, we'll, we'll trade five percent of the outstanding shares of a stock. Okay. If you take a look at um, how long the trades take, you can see that a lot of trades execute within the first hour, but a large number of trades take a full day to execute. Okay, and then there's a very small fraction that go beyond a day, but most 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 trades execute within a day, but they may take the full day to trade, five, six, seven hours. Right? If we sort of cross these. If I look at trade sizes that are less than that take less than half a percent of daily volume, um, a lot of them execute in the first hour, but still plenty of them execute throughout the day, particularly taking the full day. Um, but if I'm looking at bigger trade sizes, okay, particularly those that are you know two to five percent of the outstanding shares, none of those really execute within a couple of hours. Most of those are going to take the full day. So you can, you can sort of see what the algorithm is going to do. If you have a big trade, especially a large uh, market participation, you're going to be very patient in that trade, trying to supply rather than demand liquidity. OK, so um, just to highlight here, suppose I re-estimated the price impact function, but I separated out the trades that happened within the first hour versus those that took a full day, six to seven hours. Okay. Does the T-cost function look very different? Actually, it does. And I think this is pretty interesting. So if you're looking at trades that execute very, very fast, it follows an extremely strong square root function, right? The linear term is insignificant. The square root uh, uh, coefficient is 24 with a T-stat of uh, three and a half. But if I look at trades that execute over a full day, okay, you can see that there's a... Um, a, that the linear term is very significant, um, and the square root term is um, is is basically non-existent. Okay. Now, um, how do we think about this? Well, if you just think about the endogeneity of what's going on here, the only large trades you're going to do quickly are going to be those that you know have small or you expect to have small market impact. So that makes the um, T cost function look extremely concave, right? Um, but it's not really concave. What's happening is I'm only going to actually trade quickly a large position if I know the T cost is going to be trivial, right? So if it's in Microsoft or Apple, I'm not worried about it. I can trade that fast, right? I'm not going to I'm not going to move markets very much. But if it's something that is um, it's going to move markets, I'm going to be much more patient uh, in, in in the trade. Okay, I'm never going to execute it quickly. So trades expected to be a lot more expensive. I want to be patient on in hopes of lowering that market impact. All right. So if I were to plot this out, you can see that you get a very concave function for very fast trades because the endogeneity is very strong there. Um, but for trades where um, you know, uh, you're not going to be executing quickly, you're trying to be patient, it's going to look uh, linear. Okay. So we can actually look at this um, even a bit more finely. We could actually uh, we could actually put duration in on the right-hand side of the T-cost function and see uh, what happens here. If I look at the full sample, right? If I put in duration, I get this negative coefficient, meaning that unconditionally, right, over the full sample, if I'm trading um, 
longer, I'm lowering my T cost, which kind of makes sense, okay? Um, now, notice if I don't control for the size of the trade, I get the opposite. If I, uh, if I don't control for the size of the trade and I just look at duration, I get this false impression that trading longer actually raises my T cost. Well, that's just not true because the trades that I'm trading longer are in fact bigger trades, right? I'm not controlling for the fact that I'm, I'm trading bigger, bigger positions. And probably the nicest way to see this is if I were to break up the data into the smallest trades versus the largest trades, you can see that the duration of trade has a larger and larger impact on my trading costs, uh, depending on the size of the trade. So for really large trades, it's really important that I'm patient. I'm gonna significantly lower my market impact. For really tiny trades, it doesn't matter if I'm patient. I'm not having much of an effect anyway. So I think this is kind of neat, and I think it's starting to explain why we see a concave function when we look at average trading costs, when we're, when we're not conditioning on, on these different pieces. Okay? And again, this is something I can do with the AQR data that wouldn't be possible with other types of data. So the fact that this coefficient keeps getting larger, or more negative, uh, I think is, is, is uh, pretty nice evidence that that's what's going on, okay? So let's explore this a little further. Why is the T-cost function concave? Right? Well, I'm going to argue that it's from the endogeneity of trading. Um, that, uh, and we can talk about, by the way, there's, there's a deeper question here too, a theoretical one, which is, is the permanent, uh, uh, MI, is, it, is it the permanent market impact concave or is it the temporary one? Well, you would hope it's the temporary one because if it's the permanent one, there's a, um, there's a quasi arbitrage opportunity, um, you know, but, but I'm going to argue that that's not really what's going on, that you wouldn't be able to make money off of this. Okay. So first of all, most of the market impact is going to come from temporary market impact, not permanent. Okay. And the way I'm going to, um, the way I'm going to uh, capture these two things is I'm going to look at our T cost decay, the market impact decay, looking at the last 10 trades in the same stock in the same direction. Okay. So what you do is you look at the last 10 trades in the stock, and you adjust for whether you were trading in the same direction. Uh, so if I bought Microsoft today, I'm going to adjust for the last 10 buys in Microsoft over the last, it ends up being, you know, several weeks. Um, and you can see that you get this uh, decay in, um, in trading costs. And I'm going to call, if I adjust for those last 10 trades, I'm going to call that the temporary piece and the permanent piece is going to be the residual. Now there's lots of ways to do this. We're just going to do this with a simple 10, 10 day or 10 trade lag in the same stock. Um, actually, we had a project internally where uh, we estimated this more finely with a Kalman filter, and you could do a bunch of other uh, interesting econometric things to try to account for this. But you end up with roughly the same answer as you do with just the simple 10 day, uh, you know, lag uh, function. So um, if I were to break up every trade into this permanent piece and this temporary piece using the last 10 days of trading in the same stock as a way to measure what's permanent and what's temporary, um, what you find is that the um, temporary piece is actually quite concave. The permanent piece looks uh, fairly linear. Now, some of that's just by the way I'm defining temporary and, and permanent, but I think it's not a bad way uh, to define it. Um, and if you have other suggestions, I welcome them because I think that's an interesting thing to look at. But at least most of this concavity, the nonlinearity, seems to be coming from the piece that reverses after the last 10, 10 trades, that it's it's not a permanent piece, but more of a temporary piece. Um, so that's, that's somewhat reassuring. Um, and again, you can see that with a log-log plot as well. All right. Well, what I want to really get to then is why is this temporary piece concave? And what I'm going to try to do is um, look at this endogeneity of trading much more, um, much more closely. So um, the idea here is that I'm going to trade more if I expect the market impact to be small. I'm going to trade less if I expect the market impact uh, or trade more patiently if I expect the market impact to be large. Okay. So trade more aggressively when my expected percentage of DTV, my expected participation rate is small. Trade more patiently when, I ex when my expected participation rate is large. Now, um, I can look at this a number of ways. For instance, maybe I trade uh, aggressively for large, liquid, low, vol low volatility stocks and more patiently for small, illiquid, high vol stocks. So the characteristics of the stocks might matter here. I also might think about the market environment as being another way to uh, address this endogeneity as well. Trade more aggressively on low market vol days, more patiently on high market vol days, okay? And we can see that as well. 
Well, we can test these ideas, okay? But one of the ways to test this is I'm gonna exploit the fact that I actually know what we expected our participation rate to be. And I can look at what our actual participation rate was and look at the difference between those, okay? So here's a very simple way um, to look at this. Define my participation rate in a stock as the dollars I'm trading relative to the dollar volume that's being traded at that time. Now, when I set my trading algorithm, I can only set it based on expectations. I know what my expected dollars are going to, to be, what I want to trade to. I also have an estimate of what the expected volume will be, which typically we just use a moving average of what the past daily volume has been. But there's error in both of these, right? There's a, you could say, what, well, what's the error in the expected dollars I trade? Well, as I said, most of the times I know what I want to trade and I know what my, the dollars I'm going to trade are, but sometimes there's unexpected uh, pieces to that. For instance, um, you could argue that rebalancing, uh, redemptions, new inflows, uh, lots of things can, can give you variation in the numerator that is you know, beyond the scope of your model, for instance. Risk reduction trades would be another one, right? When we have to cut risk, when we trade against our book. But in the denominator, we have variation that happens naturally every day, which is whatever actual volume is, is, is gonna deviate from what we expected it to be. And that causes some variation in, in our participation rate. So I'm gonna to try to exploit that. Keep in mind the trading algorithm, in other words, the limit order, that the, the set of limit orders I'm setting to trade the stock has to be based on expected participation rate. So what I'm gonna do, is use the random components of what I'm actually trading, right? The deviations from expectations as a way to map out what the true T-cost function looks like. And when I say when I say the true T-cost function, what I mean is if Pete tells me I have to trade X dollars of this stock randomly right now, what does my market impact look like? And if I can vary that piece uh, throughout, what does that what does that price impact function look like? All right. Okay. So I'm going to use the error in volume, the error in the denominator, as a proxy for that random piece. You could also use variation in new flows and other things as a proxy for variation in the numerator. Let me focus on the denominator first, right? What I'm going to do is I'm going to compare the T-cost function using expected versus unexpected participation rates, right? So I'm going to look at times when the participation rate is different from expectations, and plot this thing out, which I think is kind of a, a, a nice experiment. The unexpected uh, participation rate cannot be endogenously traded, right? By definition, it's a shock to trade size. I thought I was trading half a percent of Microsoft shares. Turns out volume was cut in half and I'm now trading 1% of its daily volume, all right? And maybe my, my limit, maybe my, my algorithm can change in real time, but it's harder, it's gonna be harder to do. At least the initial trades are not going to adjust to that very fast. Right. So um, here's a first pass at this. If I look at the act, if I look at market impact versus actual uh, participation rate uh, relative to expected based on volume forecast errors, I can see how my price impact varies. Okay. So I'm looking at price impact versus expected and unexpected partici participation rate. All right. So the red here is what I expected my market impact to be based on what I thought I was going to be trading. These are for buys uh, on these stocks on that day. The blue represents what happens when I've underestimated my participation rate. Okay, So I'm participating at a level that's higher than I wanted to. And naturally, you'll see that my T costs are going to be higher. Right, That's the blue. The black represents the difference between those two. Now, for small trades, it's not going to matter very much. But for big trades, it's going to matter a lot. Okay. You can, and so just to uh, look at this in terms of a regression, if I regress to regress market impact on the on a linear and square root term of expected uh, participation rate, and did the same for unexpected, okay, where I'm going to sign it so that I can take the square root uh, um, of these things. You can see here that you, for the expected participation rate, I get a very strong square root function. That's what the, the that's the, the data wants to be explained with a, with a simple square root function. But I get um, something that looks much more, um, for, the, for the unexpected, I get a linear uh, function. In fact, the square root has a negative term um, or is insignificant in a lot of specifications. And if I run them together, you can see that 
expected participation rate follows us a very strong nonlinear function close to a square root, but the unexpected piece follows a pretty strong linear um, uh, function. Okay. Um, and so if I were to plot that out, this is this is what it looks like. Okay. And let me just you can look at it on the on the sell side uh, as well. So if I'm selling, right, um, my market impact from expected DTV, or sorry, I, I didn't mean selling. This is what it looks like when I'm underestimating my participation rate, okay? So I end up paying higher costs than I expected because I've underestimated my participation. But of course, half the time I overestimate my participation rate, in which case I'm paying lower costs than expected. It seems to be roughly symmetric. Okay, maybe it's a little worse when I underestimate than, than the gain I get from when I overestimate, but it's, it seems to be pretty symmetric. So I don't think we need to specify these separately. Okay, um, so putting this all together, this is what the underestimation uh, T cost uh, T cost look like. This is what happens when I overestimate. Um, and if I look at the unexpected market impact versus unexpected DTV, that seems to uh, follow a fairly linear um, relationship, okay? And so if I were to summarize all this, and then I, I wanna make sure I turn it over to Pete to hear his comments. Um, oh, this is, if I separate out permanent and temporary, if I were to summarize everything that I've said so far, it's that the permanent component of market impact looks to be linear. The temporary component looks to be, um, to follow a square root function. But among that temporary component, the expected piece is what follows a square root function. The unexpected piece looks linear, okay? So one way to understand, I think what's going on here is the reason we find concave uh, functions for price impact, particularly for the, is that it's all about temporary costs and it's driven, I think, by the endogeneity of trading, which is we only trade large positions when we expect the cost to be low. We only, um, we only uh, we only trade them quickly when we expect the cost to be low. Uh, we're going to be much more patient when we expect the cost to be high. And so you get this this what looks like a concave function, trade size and market impact, when in fact um, the actual true function, if you were forced to trade, would look linear. And the way that I estimate that is looking at when our participation rate is off, different from expectations, that unexpected piece follows a, a very strong linear function. Okay, and so the unexpected temporary market impact, which is exogenous to trading, looks linear, but the expected piece looks, um, you know, looks like it follows a square root function. So let me let me stop there. I want to turn it over to 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 Pete. Uh, the only final things I'll say is here I just looked at trade size, but if I throw in things like stock fixed effects um, and control for sort of the market environment as well things start to look more linear as well. So the more sort of endogenous choices I take out, the more the T-cost function starts to look linear, more like theory, and this concavity uh, tends to disappear. So let me stop there and I'll turn it over, turn it over to, to Pete. And I'll, st I'll stop sharing these slides. Okay, well, thank you very much. I will share my slides. Yeah, thank you. And I, I believe here they are. That was a really interesting presentation, and I think it's time so I got to pick up and carry on the discussion <laughs> without uh, interruption. Um, so uh, let me um, have a disclaimer here that I, I, you know, I've worked as a consultant for the government on various issues that are related to financial market regulation, but I'm also a non-executive director of a U.S. asset management company which trades global equities. But the views here are, are my own views, you know, expressed in my capacity as a professor at the University of Maryland. Um, so the outline of what I have to say is, first of all, a couple of comments about implementation shortfall, where I agree with everything Tony, uh, Toby said. And then second of all, um, I wanted to talk about testing theories. So Toby has uh, shown us a lot of results. And I want to say these results can be embedded in a market microstructure theory of price impact very nicely. You don't get exactly what Toby showed us, but you get something uh, very consistent with that. Um, to, to make these points, I'm going to uh, draw on my work uh, well, over my whole career, actually, but in particular, some recent papers with Anno Vijay, I have a market impact puzzle and a paper called uh, Adverse, from Adverse Selection, uh, Adverse Selection and Liquidity from Theory of Practice. Um, so let's first a few comments about implementation shortfall. 
it's an economically consistent way to measure opportunity cost. You know, it's kind of the right way to do cost benefit analysis uh, in this context. And I, I agree with everything Toby said um, about it, but I wanted to make a couple of points. There's a distinction between the price at which your order executes and the price in the market when your entire package of orders has finished executing. So, you know, you might be walking up a demand schedule and, you know, in which case th those numbers would be expected to be different and you'd have a factor of two to contend with. So he's, he's using the um, average price at which the orders execute. Um, another point is that you might have an alpha model that's say a momentum model or value model. And that model might say the price is gonna move by a few basis points a day towards uh, in the direction of our alpha while you're executing your order that alpha is also unfolding. And I think it was embedded in the notation Toby showed us, um, but it's something that's kind of um, important to think about. Um, so per permanent and temporary price impact, that's a distinction, which as Toby, Toby pointed out, is something that occurs after the trade is finished executing. If it reverts, it's temporary. If, it's, uh, if it doesn't revert, um, it's permanent. Um, if you don't execute all your orders, you need to attribute an opportunity cost to the orders that you didn't execute. Toby said they executed 99.9% .9 of the orders. The remaining one tenth of 1% may not be so important because it's such a small percentage, but in other uh, contexts where you're using implementation shortfall, this is really in, 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 uh, important. Uh, and finally, if you're placing many orders, like a, an asset management company might be trading the same stock, um, not necessarily day after day, but several times a month, let's say, you need to take into account um, what your intended size was in an intellectually honest way. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it would be intellectually dishonest to trade 1% of average daily volume every day, 10 days in a row, uh, knowing ex ante that you plan to trade 10% of average daily volume, but just do it over 10 days. So that, that imp that's important in this context. Okay, so for the rest of my comments, I want to uh, talk about how do you get a theoretical model uh, out of theory that uh, can work. And the beginning of a lot of this is what I call the econophysics model. It's a square root model. And the square root model says uh, delta P over P, that's your price impact the way I, I write it. It's some constant times the volatility, which is the sigma, you know, it calls sigma, times your fraction of average daily volume. Uh, where you can think of Q as the total number of shares you want to buy in that Microsoft example, it might be a million dollars worth, and V is the volume, uh, the rate of volume in the market per day. So Q over V measures how many days of volume you want to buy. Um, and the, uh, uh, the, the square root model is a really nice model for a number of different reasons. First of all, it's dimensionally consistent. So what does that mean? That means Q over V is measured in number of days of volume. So the square root of Q over V is the square root of the number of days. But sigma, we know that variance sigma squared is measured per day. So sigma, the square root of variance is also measured per square root of a day. Um, and it cancels with the Q over V to the one half. So sigma times Q over V to the one half is a dimensionless quantity. That's theoretically nice. Um, another interesting uh, fact about this is that constant is often uh, estimated as something like one or the square root of a half or a half, some, something along in there. I think maybe Toby's results are more like a half, but um, that may be because he's looking at walking up the demand schedule and having price impact that's not the total price impact at the end of the order execution, in which case you'd have to multiply by two and it would be one, which would be uh, exactly the, the square root model. The second interesting thing about the square root model is that it is uh, empirically really powerful. If you just fit this model to Toby's data, my guess is it, it would fit quite well and, and it would combine the, uh, the sigma term that he, he throws in his regression and the Q over V term with a one half uh, exponent, which he throws in as the square root. The theory here says they should be multiplicative. The way you did it in your regressions, I think is linear, but I would suggest doing them multiplicatively to see, uh, to see how it works. Um, the, it's also kind of beautiful that the constant here is the same for all stocks. Um, now, what's wrong with the square root model is that it's theoretically nonsensical, at least if you're talking about permanent price impact, for the reasons Toby said, that if you have linear price impact, that, that kind of works. But if you have nonlinear price impact, it implies quasi-arbitrage uh, opportunities in the context of a permanent price impact model. So that's what we need to, we need to kind of fix it to make it theoretically nice. Okay, well, my 85 paper uh, is a way to fix it. Um, it's a linear price impact model. 
um, it says that the change in price is some function, some number of lambda times Q, where the Q is the quantity traded. It's theoretically nice because the linear impact is consistent with no arbitrage. Price impact is permanent here, um, which is also kind of uh, consistent. Um, it, it theoretically can explain adverse selection and market power, but it's got some empirical shortcomings, one of which is you need a different lambda for every stock. <laughs> the theory at sigma, sigma V over sigma U or something like that, but every stock has a different sigma V and every stock has a different sigma U. Um, and sigma U is this volatility and noise trading, which is hard to measure empirically. So how did you kind of convert this into a decent empirical model? Well, the first thing you can do is scale the variable so that the variable so that the dimensionless quantities show up as dimensionless. And so I just rescaled it here at the bottom and sigma squared Q over V, uh, sigma squared is measured per, per day, um, variance per day, and Q over V is number of days, excuse me, of um, volume. Okay, so both of these factors now I factored into two dimensionless quantities, but the lambda has stock specific characteristics in there and volume and volatility are also characteristics. So there's something we have to uh, worry about. So how do we do that? And that's another strand of my research. <laughs> it's more recent than my 85 paper. And that's my work on invariance uh, with Anobajaiva. And there we have a liquidity measure. That's a stock specific liquidity measure. And we think it can help us with the scaling here. Uh, you know, that, that different stocks need a kind of different lambda. So this liquidity measure has got a, a funny looking definition, but there's a, we, we describe in our papers why this is almost the necessary definition. You've got dollar volume in the numerator. If you look at the definition of L and the equation on the right hand side there, uh, you've got dollar volume P times V, that's price times volume uh, in the numerator. You've got return variance in the denominator, that's the sigma squared. And then you have two constants C and M. C is measured in dollars, M is dimensionless. And so the result, and you take the cube root of it, but the result is a dimensionless liquidity measure that's also what we call leverage neutral. Um, that's a, a, a nice property here. You read about uh, read these papers to figure out exactly uh, what that means. But we've got these stock specific characteristics, volume and volatility that we think are suggested by theory built into this L measure. And so if you look at the delta P over P equation, the lambda uh, factor has been replaced by L over M. So L is this liquidity measure, and that's telling you exactly how what Lambda looks like across stocks. Uh, we, we did it in our 2016 paper slightly differently. We had a kind of L sigma divided by M and then the sigma multiplying the Q over V, but it, it's, it's the same thing. And so what we did in our 2016 paper is we show in a data set that's kind of similar to, to Toby's data set. Um, that's a big, big, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of institutional trades. We showed that this, um, this, this um, specification fits the uh, implementation shortfall data that we had uh, very well, but it, the square root model fitted it slightly better. <laughs> so we think that if getting it theoretically consistent, we, we actually lost a little bit of explanatory power. And so uh, there's a puzzle as how to explain that. And Toby's got exactly the same thing going on in his paper. The square root model, I think, fits very well to a first order. Uh, when you try to add bells and whistles to it, it's gonna be hard to prove it. But you know maybe you can. So this is uh, one way to go. So now how do we uh, how do we improve it? And Toby already suggested how you might improve it. Theory says that that permanent price impact kind of has to be linear. But theory doesn't say that temporary price impact has to be linear. <laughs> okay. Um, so if you have temporary price impact, maybe you can make it non-linear. Well, let's look at the theory of temporary price impact. And it turns out, uh, I have another paper with Anubhajaiva and also with Yajun Wan that addresses this. And this is a paper in which every trader is a, a big institutional investor, we think of them running a model. And in the theory, they actually behave exactly the way that, that Toby said his asset management company behaves. <laughs> they estimate a kind of, let's call it an alpha model or a, an academic finance professor model. They come up with a target portfolio they would like to own. And they realize that because of uh, market impact costs, they can't just go into the market and buy that portfolio tomorrow morning on the open like a perfect competitor. Instead, they take into account their market impact costs and they gradually move in the direction of that target portfolio at an endogenously determined rate that takes into account their market impact costs. So they have a, in the theory, they have an alpha model 
they have a target portfolio that's calculated from, you can think of it as a mean variance problem, and they take into account trading costs and convert that into trading. Okay, well, what does the trading look like? Well, the trading is that they trade gradually, which means they break their orders up in little pieces and execute the pieces over time. That's exactly what Toby says uh, happens in, in his real world uh, uh, data. And then, well, let's look at the equations up here at the top. The equation says that the price impact, what comes out of the theory is lambda times Q. That's a permanent impact that's similar to my D5 paper. And then there's another term that's kappa times DQ DT. That's temporary price impact that is linear. And here, remember, we're going in the direction nonlinear, but uh, it's temporary price impact is linear in the speed in some sense with which you were trading. Now we can approximate the speed with which you're trading by replacing the DQ DT with just Q over H. Q over H is kind of the average derivative of your inventory because H is the horizon or number of days over hours over which you execute your order, okay? Um, and so what it gives you is uh, two terms, the Lambda Q term, kind of like my 85 paper, and then this other term that has temporary price impact. Okay. Um, Keep in mind, prices would be changing even in the absence of trading. If you have this alpha model, it's important in principle to take that into account. And the theoretical model takes it into account um, as well. So the smooth trading model, theoretically, it, everything is optimal. Your trading strategy is optimal. You're optimizing at a game theoretic setting. Um, theoretically, it's manipulation proof. Empirically, you, uh, Toby showed that the institutional trades are shredded into little pieces, just like the theory says, and empirically, Toby showed that some of the price impact is temporary um, and some of it, uh, and the permanent part of it is linear, just like this theory says. The only discrepancy with the theory is that the temporary piece, according to Toby, is nonlinear. Maybe it's a square root model, whereas the theory says it's linear. Well, that's pretty easy to fix. We fix it by saying, let's make the same way Toby said. <laughs> it's a big trade that's going to have a lot of impact. We want to take that impact into account. And the way we do it is we execute the trade more slowly. So let's choose a horizon of trade execution that's some function of how big the order is. So here, uh, I've, I've made it a, 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 an exponential function, q to the h power. You can think of h as a half, so h is meant, meant to be an abbreviation for a half. And so if h is a half, then you get a square root model of price impact, which is what Toby uh, said works. And that's because you're, you're doing the bigger trades more slowly according to an exponential function. So what do you get? When you put all these pieces together, you get a complete model that I've written here as three terms. The first term, um, I put a, a lambda bar in there, not the lambda from 95 paper, but it has units, but a kind of dimensionless version where uh, you use the L to kind of uh, correct for it. That's the permanent price impact and it multiplies sigma squared Q over V, which is a dimensionless quantity that's linear in the quantity traded. So this is linear permanent price impact. The second component I haven't talked about, but that's a fixed cost of the trade. You can think of it as a bid ask spread cost or the fee that you pay to high frequency traders. It's like bid ask balance. It's what temporary price impact that goes away immediately, but it's independent of the size of the trade. So it's a, a fixed cost. So now that I call alpha bar over L. And then the third one is the temporary price impact that I was talking about previously, where you're using a kind of square root function to slow down your order execution of the big trades. And then what's left is a square root model of price impact, just like we started with above, but it's all temporary and therefore it's consistent uh, with the theory. And we would have to estimate a kappa. So my suggestion is that Toby could use this as a much more parsimonious model than what you actually estimate. It's only got three parameters. <laughs> um, the theory even says kappa bar might be one, so in which case it doesn't have, uh, you know, in theory you might even say lambda bar is one, um, but um, an alpha bar maybe is institutionally uh, determined. Um, so this is a really simple model, but notice that it's got stock specific characteristics built in in a very specific way that's a sum of three different types of components. The characteristics are built into the L, the volume, because L is a function of volume and volatility with the Q root in it. So it, it, it kind of looks complicated, but it's very easy to estimate. And it um, seems to be consistent with what Toby says he found, namely that the first term, that linear term in Q over V is a permanent price impact, you know, it's permanent that the uh, last term, I'm not sure about, we didn't talk too much about the constant term, but the, the last term, which is the temporary price impact does look like a square root. And so it looks like uh, this theory, which uh, we explained in those two papers that I, 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 uh, I, I mentioned at the uh, beginning, 
this this theory should fit uh, the data quite well. So I would suggest to just try running. This is much harder than running what you've run, um, and you'll you'll see that that you you will you'll be able to explain some things that your current methodology might not pick up. For example, if you try to trade ten percent of one day's volume in Apple stock, well, most people don't want to trade that much Apple stock in one day. If you did do it, it would have enormous price impact, much more than probably what your model is forecasting. But why is that? That's because our uh, permanent price impact term has L in it. L is a measure of liquidity. And for Apple stock, that L value would be extremely high, meaning permanent price impact is going to be gigantic in the more liquid stocks. When you scale the quantity you trade as a fraction, Q over V of the uh, daily volume of those stocks. And similarly, if you're trading very illiquid stocks, you would get um, much lower uh, permanent price impact uh, than, than I think uh, you would find. So I'm, I'm just predicting what you would find in your data set. <laughs> I'm pretty confident you'll find it because we found it um, in ours. So my conclusion is Toby's got a great data set. Uh, you can test these models. It's it, the, the approach you take is kind of what I would call empirical ad hoc. Empirically ad hoc, you're being descriptive and you're being descriptive in a good way, getting these first order effects out there. But the theory of permanent temporary price impact with invariance and with this square root uh, uh, idea of, of executing the big trades more slowly, that gives you a model with a very, very specific structure and you can actually test this model. And my prediction is it might even work better than what you've got in the paper right now, but it should work quite well, especially picking up things like uh, big trades and big stocks and big trades and small stocks. So those are my comments. Thanks, Thank you. Pete. That was great. Yeah, thanks, Toby and Pete, for a great talk and discussion. Um, I don't see any questions from the audience at, the, uh, at this point. Uh, Toby, we still have a couple of minutes. So would you like to perhaps reply to some of Pete's points? Um, you know, all I want to say, look, Pete, that was an excellent discussion as, as, as I expected. Um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we should impose more structure. And actually, I was, I was hoping your comments would head in this direction because I, I figured they probably would. Um, I, you're right. The, the first pass of this has been purely descriptive uh, empirically. And I think there's some interesting results. And now what I think our next step ought to be is to take some of those pieces and, and uh, I agree with you, impose more structure from theory to see if that works better. And I'm actually really intrigued to see if this would work. You might be right. It might work better, um, which, is, which is really interesting. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to try this. So thank you. Thanks for the great comments. Okay. Um, what, oh, one thing I would add, um, Pete mentioned this briefly, and, and I said it in my notes too, which is in, in the, with the implementation shortfall, and, and Pete made an important point about you do have to worry about the opportunity cost if there's trades that you aren't executing. For the trades we look at, they do get executed 99.9% .9 of the time. There are a set of trades that I'm not using in our database that we could use, which would be like stat arb you know, kind of more short-term trades. Those would also be interesting to look at, to look at this other piece, which is the opportunity cost piece, because that's exactly where you leave stuff, you know, you will choose not to trade simply because the, the trading cost exceeds the opportunity cost. Um, so I think that's a whole another interesting area of research that would use a different set of trades to look at, but it would also be interesting to look at those in this context as well and add that alpha piece that, that Pete was talking about. I think that would be really cool. So thanks. There is uh, one question, Toby, from the audience. Um, so the question is, do you see any seasonality in the data? Do I see any seasonality in, in, yes. in the trading costs? Yes. Um, so by seasonality, you mean with, um, you know, day of the week or, or end of the month? I think what you do see is like, um, you know, er, like when earnings are announced, that's always, uh, there's a lot of information that comes out. Um, you see that volatility changes um, you know, pretty, pretty sharply. Most of the seasonal effects that um, people talk about with TCOS, I think you can capture with um, volume and volatility. And those are the two pieces that Pete was emphasizing in his model as well. I think that captures most of it, um, but certainly information events uh, drive that. So there's seasonality with respect, with respect to that, but I think you can capture it with volume and volatility. So an interesting question here, that we have addressed in a different paper with Torben Anderson and Oleg Andreko and Anna Vichyva is whether um, the volume and volatility that goes into uh, a transaction cost model is the volume and volatility you expect during the next minute <laughs> that some part of your order might be executed or is it the volume and volatility kind of over some long period of time like the previous month or the previous year? 
And it, it seems like there's some evidence it would be the next minute, in which case um, these different th three different components of price impact have different types of seasonality. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like when the market's closed, uh, you know, maybe price impacts higher because volume's low. Um, at the open and the close, maybe at the open, the price impacts high because volatility is high, but at the close it's low because vol volatility is low and volume's high. So you get that kind mm -hmm. of seasonality consistent with this if you allow volume and volatility to vary uh, throughout the day. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, I will probably have to stop our recording uh, shortly. Before we do, a quick uh, advertisement for the next seminar, which is gonna be on uh, May 16th. Uh, where we'll have uh, Marcelo Medeiros presenting his paper and um, uh, on um, factor models. And uh, uh, okay, so for now we can probably stop the recording. And there was one more question. I hope I hope that Joel Hansbrook uh, actually gonna join us in the informal discussion to ask the question. Otherwise, uh, I can I can ask um, I can ask.